of the IndyK Conference, along with John Sharp and Andy Nealon. Thanks for coming. We're here for experimental gameplay workshops. Robin Linicky is going to lead the way. We've got both uh, uh, participants who are virtual as well as <laughs> virtual, <laughs> non virtual. Virtuous. Yeah, virtuous. <laughs> That's what that
experience of the story. It's version of A. Um, we have sort of thought of this as more of like an archaeology. It's been 500 years since the princess has fallen asleep. And the, uh, the princes over the years have broken into the, the, the palace and have taken eight objects from the place where she sleeps. But here and there in the palace, there's uh, a window that is open. It's a small window, and, and so it's too small for you to, to crawl into. But a little girl can um, go inside. And when she does, you can, you can see inside the rooms of the palace. The little girl will get magical powers throughout the game that will help you correct all these things that are wrong. Like if there's a wall that is broken, she will have a spell that can, that can fix that wall. Or all the house plants are withered and the fountain is still flowing. So she will have a spell to make that water work again. Or turn turn the, the lamps on again.
so it's uh, rewarding. It was a lot of fun, and I hope I get to be cooler again, because I was very, very sure. <laughs> Do you feel like it was a different kind of game being in the middle than being on the outside? Oh, definitely. It's a whole different strategy being the ruler as opposed to being on the outside. It's just, and to look around, you have to be aware of your strategies a little more. It's just, it's really fun to be the ruler of that game. And, uh, and how did you feel about your short sin as the ruler and the senator? Uh, was it short? I thought I did. <laughs> Relationship with people, 
where do we pray, right. keep your alliances, but really we're, we were not really sure where this is going and going back and forth. And I, I just want, uh, um, what I'm interested in, so Eric is interested to the Greek with number like he's in the very far end. And then I kind of translated in a Greek, which is still that way, but I feel like it's a good chessboard in a public part. And and, and at the end, there's not really a reason in the game why the platform on one bigger, one smaller, it's just that look more like a, a, a constellation and, uh, and it's just a tentative again to maybe this way is just hide the regularity but to show it more as a um, natural or organic yes. and Something in general about, which is hugely different between what Eric does and what I do, is that we play chess so many times, but then I get one shot, I get it done, <laughs> with all of the setup, and, um, and we can play chess up to a certain point where it's a feeling of the players, um, but when we play chess, they, they had a one dollar value above them instead of a 20 feet um, wide weather balloon. Seven more of that, which does change a lot of the feeling of the experience. Uh, one reason was this was exhibited right in front of the glass facade of the Roma. Uh, if there was only a grid on the floor, nobody would perceive that this is something happening, we just look like a crowd, and even you would feel old. I think it was just good to have a roof above your head to say, here something is happening, but like the same umbrella. And I think that's something... Uh, well, that's something that I've learned working with Natalie. For those of you that know, 16 tons. It's a, it's a small grid with that paper wall around it. And that wall is so important to the game. The wall's not mentioned in the rules. It's not an essential part of any mechanic. You can play the game on a tabletop without the wall. But, but what I've learned is that the way that that wall shapes base creates this kind of private betting pit is so important. Last year at IDK, we were taking it down. People were playing that game to the very last minute. We took the wall down because we were having to pack it up, and the game was so infinite without that wall around it, just the just the spots on the floor in a, in a, in a certain way. Yeah, it's something. Yeah, it, 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 so it's so what I one of the things I've learned from Natalie is that you know game designers pretend to be very black and white. Well, this is part of the functioning of the game. This is not. But in 16 tons, the the, the, the the sort of halo of balloons, even though the central balloon is part of a mechanic, you're trying to pull it down step by step through the ruler and the different sizes of the grid, there there are these sort of gray areas where they, they do make the game a game, but they're not they're not intrinsically part of the part of the rules. Just some images that right. um, anything else you want to say? I I what I learned about game is that they are much more cruel and the architecture in a way because <laughs> if it works it's clear and if it does then it's even more clear people won't fail. Uh, so it's, it's rewarding, it's immediate gratification but it's also extremely uh, immediate when it's not working. And you know games, architectures for me is at Florida School the opposite of the media. I mean it, it's amazing to work with a designer whose, whose objects, whose designed objects are meant to last for centuries. Right? Architects are so careful, they're so rigorous. If you make a broken game, no one's going to play. If you make a broken building, you're going to kill people. Yeah. So there's a, there's, I mean, there's, there, it's, just, it's amazing from every, every aspect of architecture, the fact that getting an architectural license is similar to like getting a medical license because you have people's you know, lives in your hands and it's just, it's a, it's a, very, it's a very different kind of uh, process. This is our last image. Um, we just, this was just a little sketch that we found in a notebook on the airplane right over here at EDK that we wanted to put in. And this is just our four projects we're thinking about how each one creates a different kind of physical space over here and a different kind of space of meaning or gameplay. And I think that in a lot of our ways, a, a lot of ways, and how we can, you know, how we, we can explain what these little scribbles mean, but they're each, each different the way that they constellate the, the gameplay space of meaning and the, and the, and the physical space of meaning. So it, it's really something uh, that we learn from each other. Fighting. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.
you guys need radio accompaniment? <laughs> me to be on this. Uh, it was actually before I knew, or before in fact Damien knew, that Damien would also be on the panel, so uh, Robin was asking more about my entire range of, of collaboration behaviors uh, to talk about that. So there'll be some of that, and also at very uh, crucial, important moments, Damien will, is also here to, to represent the work that he did, because you'll see it's been a lot of it. So. Uh, uh, just to preface it, actually, it's kind of interesting, and no one's really brought it up, but like, there is some kind of connection between the uh, collaborative process and perhaps the romantic process. And let me just be the first person to say that. Um, but when Damien and I met, it was actually on an online site for making music, and then subsequently to that, we actually became a couple. And that was uh, many years back, and then we started working on projects together, and this is the first of them. Um, I guess it was the first game project, because that was like the beginning of your programming career. Uh, Lapin uh, Diver, and also on this project, Phil Fish was, was involved. And um, I think the important thing about this is we didn't really anticipate that the collaboration would, would go as well as it did, because it was really intense, but it actually went so well that the three of us decided we really wanted to work on projects like that again. And that was like the basis of the founding of Kokoromi. Um, and Cindy came on very quickly thereafter because we worked on a project with her and it was just like, it was like the magic happened. And I think part of that is just because of the differing um, strengths and skills that we all had and, and how they were able to sort of mesh together, um, both technical, artistic, um, managerial or, or whatever. But also, of course, that, that we all got along together really well and yeah, definitely have arguments and things like that. But, but we're able to get through them. I think that's the important thing. Does the, does the argument like, completely shut down all possibility of, of moving forward or not? And if it doesn't, then that's a pretty good collaboration. That's what you can hope for. Um, uh, I also wanted to, to just touch briefly on the projects that I was doing, uh, specifically with Cindy, because it also um, ties more. I feel like even though I didn't like get to that one one woman wonder that I thought in my head was like the thing, which I've now kind of like realized is, you know, forget that. It's not it's not worth it. Um, and that like the my ability though to to actually collaborate better was strengthened by by doing that. And um, in fact, that that then led to the the next project that Damien and I worked on together. Um, so I don't know how many of you know about the, the Oh My God remote. It's not a game, it's an iPhone app. It uh, uses the iPhone touchscreen controller to, uh, touchscreen to control a vibrator that it's connected to. And I actually um, got, uh, Damien was the programmer on this, and I actually think that I would not have even conceived of the possibility of making this app had I not um, been uh, known so well what Damien was uh, capable of because it's really an audio-driven app and he had like in the process of all of our previous projects developed a, um, uh, well actually you should talk about Minim if any of you call it. Oh, sorry. Uh, one of the first games that we did as Kokoromi was a game called Glee, which was for the first Gamma that we did and it was a, the theme of Gamma 1 was uh, audio-driven games. We wanted people to take the input from the DJ that was playing at the party and analyze that input and then have that affect the game in some way, like be important to the actual game. So we made a we made a game that generated these little guys that you were supposed to collect based on the beat analysis of the music coming in. So like there were dudes that showed up with the bass drum kick and then the snare kick. Um, and so I, I had to do some that, and uh, as a result of the, the audio library that I used to do that, I was annoyed by it. I was like, I think I can do better than this, so I went on and started to write my own. Um, and so the oh my pod audio is from a C++ sort of version of that. Um, but that sort of set me on the road of like making some more like audios uh, programming. I wanted to I wanted 
address the other side of what Heather's talking about a little bit, where where she might feel like she doesn't have all the technical skills available to her to, to be a one woman show and, and make everything go. Um, like, yeah, I can figure out how to use physics engines and things like that and understand the programming side of things, but, but often if I sit down and try to think about like games to make, um, little ideas come and, and I can do things that are interesting tech demos, um, but it doesn't always lead to a full game. And so it's really helpful to, to collaborate with another person who has more of a cohesive game-like vision, who then we can work together to, to make that happen, right? And um, it's not so bad, because one of the cool things about working with somebody else is that when you do something, you can show it to them and be like, check out this cool thing that I did. And they'll be like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Let's do this now. Um, rather than you know being stuck in your basement by yourself in like a single feedback loop, trying to find and search your way to that cool thing that you think people are going to like, and, and then make it go. Like, I mean, it's like it's like having a play tester, you know, at your side at all times, who is also, you know, invested in the project and, and intelligent and can make good decisions about the direction the project should go. It, it actually occurred to me to say that in this whole narrative, uh, around this point in time, or maybe even slightly before, Damien and I broke up. <laughs> but we actually kept collaborating together because everything you've seen afterwards is actually still projects that we worked on. Um, and in fact, uh, I think the most interesting and kind of funny thing is that uh, his girlfriend Amanda now is, she's an artist and has worked on, on Spider and, and a few other games, but she actually did the graphics for this project. So, so it was a collaboration also with her. So I just you know, thought that was really a nice way for the whole thing to end up. Um, and then I just briefly wanted to talk about a few other things that I'm doing now as far as my future collaborations and ongoing ones. Um, at this very instant, uh, there's a show that's up in Paris called Carte Blanche, uh, Taige Kogogomi, and that uh, Cindy and I organized with our friend Lynn Hughes, who runs uh, the Tag Lab, or started the Tag Lab at Concordia University in, in Montreal. And actually, a lot of the projects that I've shown had some kind of uh, involvement from one of the departments at at, uh, at Concordia. And I think that that also is a, a really important collaborative environment. You see a lot of collaboration going on uh, at university. So um, I didn't want to forget to mention that. But it's like literally right now in Paris, they're they're uh, having a they've curated we've curated this show of, of games that are is showing right now like opening and there's like hundreds of people in this gallery as we speak, and which is why they couldn't actually also be on Skype. They wanted to join us really, but it, it wouldn't really be possible. And then I'm also working on one other project with a group called uh, Modern Nomads called the Dare Droid. They um, developed this robotic dress that serves cocktails, and you have to play truth or dare. And uh, if you play with the model as being your sort of judge of whether you've successfully played it, but um, they are more of a technology and fashion group, and realized that their truth or dare game wasn't really uh, very well integrated with their the rest of the project. So I'm collaborating with them right now to, to get the the game itself, which is actually being played in like a, a, a a smart device that the that the model is wearing to get that actually more integrated with all the sensors, like the dress can sense where you are standing relative to it and, and things like that. So the collaboration uh, addiction continues endlessly. So no. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Is that true? I hope it does actually, because make everything cooler. Hey guys, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm kind of a little nervous right now. I just started selling crystal meth, and it's just really put me on edge lately. So I seem a little skittish. That's why. Um. So Damien and I. Oh right, that's key. Um, while, while we're plugging it in, I'll tell you the story of how we met. Um, hold on, I got note cards, because I'm all pro. Um, so I'm, I, I own a game audio company called Gleek, and um, Damien and I met because a client that he used to work for, uh, we were working on one of their games. And, you know, we're working on the game for, I guess, 
three or four months, and I go down to Austin, and I want to see the progress, see where the game's at. And uh, I, um, yeah, I, actually, I kind of want to stand. Is that okay? <laughs> um, so yeah, I go to Austin, and, and Damien's sitting on the couch. And the first thing I ever hear him say is, oh my god, these are the worst fucking sounds I've ever heard. <laughs> and so, so we met, we became pretty fast friends. Um, and I guess the way that this project started, you want to tell a little bit about that? Uh, I guess this, this project, no, well you had the, you had oh. the idea genesis. Yeah, so, um, the, yeah, I guess, I guess I was, I'll, I'll hint at it. I was sitting at a, um, with a friend of mine who said that he couldn't, he could no longer relate to, uh, he, he owns a, a publishing company, and he felt like he could no longer relate to the modern gamer. And he just wanted a game where you just kind of had fun and played around. And so I started thinking about how much fun I had playing music, because I come from an electronic music background. And uh, I felt like, you know, making music and creating music is something that most people never get to experience. Like truly, um, like the instant gratification of getting actual like feedback right in front of you and hearing that feedback manifest itself. Uh, that's something that, that most people aren't accustomed to. And it's been interesting when playing playtesting this game with people, how they don't really, because it's not visual, they're not, they feel like something's not happening or something, they're like they're not winning or something like that. However, um, so that's kind of where the project started. And uh, we had a project cancellation. And actually, one of our sound guys went to Los Angeles to do some time at Naughty Dog. So we had an empty office. And Damien and I started this project. So that's kind of how it began. Yeah, there was a, there was an initial prototype that we did uh, like a couple of years ago um, that was sort of a 2D prototype. And I think we started talking about it just because Matt and I get along pretty well. We have inter music, interest in music in common. Um, like I have a degree in music composition, I'm a programmer. Um, and he told me about this idea for this piece of game. And I was like, well, I can probably put it to that. I can try that out. And so we did it. It was kind of like on a controller, um, but then we got sort of swallowed by our industry drive. Um, so coming back to it, it was, um, it was a lot of fun. And of course, technology has changed now. so. Touch device, which is a little bit more immediate to like tap out your rhythms instead of having like a DSP controller. Yeah, we'll, we'll show the game real quick. Um, I'm ho I hope we don't get radio because um, it's a music game. It's kind of key. Uh, oh, is it turned off? Yeah, we could have we could pull pull both mics and go to the stereo actually. <laughs> It's going to sound pretty bad, but you guys will get the idea. Um, actually, if you go over towards the, uh, the desktop here. Um, I just have, I made a little build of it. Yeah. It's, notice how prototype is written with seven exclamation points. That's key. Uh, no, how real is this one? Just to explain while Matt's playing, uh, 
Basically, this is a game that is sort of a premature uh, music drum sequencing for you. So, there are a bunch of different little guys that fly out, and each of them have an instrument. And so, if there was a bass that you just did, this is a drum kit. Uh, there are the pedal flying there, the keyboard, you don't have like a sync sound. Um, and all you do is you tap on the pads, and you can run up, and the chords that you're doing quantize them into the system. Shut up. <laughs> um, anyway, here's him rocking out. Let me see if I can rock him. Yeah, he's he's wailing pretty hard. And he was playing a, a block prototype of this. So he's just he's just jamming and like I literally showed him how to play it one time. And the, his music is awful, I'm gonna be honest. Like, <laughs> the output's terrible. But how much fun he had playing it was like it's super cheesy. It was it was actually super heartwarming. I didn't shed a tear or anything, but I did like a push-up for my homies. <laughs> anyway, so that's him playing that. Um, now I want to show you guys, here's what's difficult. Um, my, this is the sort of fun part. So Damien and I are excellent collaborators because we're like each side of the brain. Um, you know, because I'm an audio guy, so I'm not, I'm used to telling designers that, oh, you guys should do this, and wouldn't this be pretty sweet if this happened? And they're used to telling me no. So, you know, like, like actually trying to design a game and having to think through your ideas is incredibly difficult. I still tell it no. Yeah, there's a lot of no going on. But, so here's the, here's the first part of our process. I draw really amazing pictures, and these are pictures of each of our mechanics. This is uh, the drum pad. This is uh, what we call the gator. And this is a, an inner app. This is a, a one-shot. That's some early concept art. Um, and then that becomes this. That becomes, basically, I, we mind map everything. There's no documents, there's no word docs for this game at all. It's all in mind map format, and they're all PDFs. So this is a play test I did. I was like, this is fun, this is not fun. And we do these, and we basically make our task, li task lists based on this. And you wanna talk a little bit about that maybe? Uh, which, which I find to be actually super helpful in mind map format, we 
makes it immediately clear where, where the root tasks are. And, and at the end of each sort of branch in the MindMap tree, you basically have an itemized list of here's the things that I need to do. So you don't need to like pull like individual tasks out of some like more cohesive design document that's been written. I think this also helps us stay really like agile because it's really easy to just throw away a mind map for like whatever we spent like two minutes making. Okay. And just think about um, some of the processes you guys have that are very different. Obviously, you guys are working on the same stuff. We had fewer things up here than it's difficult to find time to need to work on stuff where you won't be able to have that feedback uh, necessarily to the last minute, but Eric and his team came back with the process. And you are collaborating with so many people across so many different projects. Like, how do you guys manage these like really different styles of feedback for, for your partners and in your case the, the difference? I would love to hear. Email is so bad sometimes because the threads get out of control. I mean, everyone's experienced this, but but even within one group, like the, the people that are responding to things that other people have already answered and changed, and and just I, I I'm dreaming of when they're actually some of when a system's going to come along for the communication management because different people uh, that um, Google Wave tried it, but it was even worse, and like obviously it so. Yeah, I don't know. I would take a million and all advice for like how to track conversations about discussions about things, heated heated discussions about things. That's what I want to to know how to do. You never did. The game or no? <laughs> you don't mean the, the game dinner? Do you mean the actual thing going to? I, I think this works between us just because we are. There was in a different way. I mean, I mean, I'm amazing that you can continue working together. Uh, but I think that the way we work, just because of every moment of the day, coming to the new way, uh, and it's very fun. Well, I, I don't know. I, I also think um, uh, design is problem solving. And one of the best things in my collaborations with Natalie, I, also, like Heather, does many, many collaborations with, uh, at any given moment um, with different groups. I just think that the main thing is trust, respect, and uh, communication, and clearly defined roles that are permeable. So, you know, Natalie trusts me to really have my shit together for game design, and I, she has, you know, incredible skills as an architect. Well, at the same time, we keep each other honest because Natalie doesn't is not a gamer, and she doesn't play a ton of games. She she brings fresh eyes to any game project, and she has a she has a really strong instinct for for truth, from my point of view, in terms of really like immediately seeing the weakness of a design, or when I'm hoping that something works but really doesn't work, or when I'm falling into a trap of, a, of some genre of game. And she says, "Well, why are we doing that?" I say, "Well, that's the way it's done." And she says, "Well, it doesn't have to be that way." And I and I, hopefully I'm similar in terms of architecture that I I can kind of keep you honest, and so we. We joke about how we, we fight a lot, but it, it's very contentious. But I think that um, you know, uh, critical feedback is the way that designers show each other respect. So we're, we have a lot of respect in our relationship. <laughs> 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 Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll throw in. Um, I think for for us, uh, collaboration. Um, you, you have to respect the autonomy of someone first and foremost, and you have to like like it's you have to let go of uh, sometimes what it is exactly that you want, and you have to let people work on what they want to work on. It's you you that's like true collaboration, and if you have autonomy and people are excited about the task that they're going to do, then they're going to do a better job. Because I work the same way, so I think what works for us is we just have a real clear, uh, we have a, a clear objective of what it is we want to accomplish, but we allow each other to, you know, be autonomous and kind of do it, what it is that we want to work on at that time, because that's going to yield the best results. I, I think, I mean, a lot of my ideas about collaboration also were formed during, uh, when running Game Lab for, for about 10 years, and there's a lot of Game Labbers in the audience right now, a uh, few of them right there. Um, and so one of, one of the principles of collaboration in Game Lab was that we never had creative directors on projects, people, it, and this really worked in groups of, say, you know, 
three to three to eight people. I think if you're on a 50, 100 person project, it's a, it's a totally different scale. But we, you know, I think that the, in addition to respect and trust and communication, everyone really knew what they were doing. So, so the audio person was really in charge of the audio, right? There wasn't a creative director telling them thumbs up or thumbs down in each decision. And if you have a if you have a bad situation, then people get territorial and say, well, don't tell me how to do the audio. That's my role. I'm the boss. You're not supposed to be doing the audio. If you have a good situation, it's the opposite. People are desperate for feedback. They're saying, please, I need, I need more feedback on each iteration. I, I need you to help me understand how, how the audio integrates into the interactive design or the visual design of the story or the, the technical aspects of the game. And so if you have people desperate for that kind of critical feedback and interaction. And then when you have that kind of percolating, collaborative sort of uh, cauldron bubbling up, ideas can come from anywhere. And then you, then you do have your art director having audio ideas. You have your audio person having game design ideas. And people are welcoming it. And it's more kind of fuel on the fire. Um, and I think a huge part of that is people you know, knowing, knowing their expertise but not being precious about, about their expertise and, and not being precious about their ideas. And we, you know, it, it, and no one, no one, it's weird to me when people say, well, this is my idea. I brought this in. No one knows this is my ideas. As far as I'm concerned, any idea that you have is similar to some other idea you had before it by another person, an other project, and you saw in another game, and and I, you know, the ideas are sort of the residue of people's ongoing uh, design uh, explorations through through projects and conversations and collaborations. So, you know, I think the best thing is for people to not hold on to ideas, but just release them into the mix, where the whole becomes more than sort of part. So, but it's a beautiful thing, collaboration. I know Natalie's saying you're talking too much. <laughs> but, uh, collaboration's like a game. You know, you, you create rules and the play occurs. So it's the same thing with collaboration. So uh, we're afraid to plug in the microphone because we don't want the microphone to really sound like radio music, but everyone wants to say hi, so hi everybody. Hi. Hi. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you guys a question um, about your collaboration thought. You've been listening to us talking and stuff, so give us a little bit of feedback about what you've been hearing. Okay, can you hear us now? Yeah. Yay. Okay, great. Um, so I Are you guys lying? Are you are you giving us a bunch of BS about how great your collaborations are? Is it as smooth as you're making it sound? No, it's not smooth between us. No, there's a huge amount of conflict, but I'm afraid to give you this microphone. Here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, uh, we embrace embrace productive conflict as part of the game. Yeah, it's self promotion uh, louder than uh, positive and uh, realistic, negative and. <laughs> uh, to this point, I, I feel like Matt, Matt and my collaboration has been very smooth. Uh, it helps that we, I think we both see eye to eye on where we want the game that we're making to, to go, what we want it to be. That, that helps focus the discussions a lot. We definitely disagree, it's always, but it, it is usually very amicable. Um, but it, it's also possibly the case that we're still in the honeymoon phase, so we'll see where that goes. Um, you know, there are definitely times working on projects with Heather where I got pretty annoyed with her and, and you know, expressed that to her to some degree or, or another. Um, 
and it's like it's like a really it's like a it is very much like a, a romantic relationship where they, yeah you you're gonna jump down each other's throats and disagree on that stuff but you well I mean yeah anyway uh, but you you work through those things because hopefully at the core somewhere you realize you have a commonality with this person and you can actually make something great. I think it is because collaboration is about intimacy and it's really. I guess, um, do you guys have questions for these guys? We, we started a little late, so I figured we'd go until about 3.45, so we have about you know, eight minutes left, and we could just chat a little bit about collaboration. Um, obviously, uh, you know, we we wanted to give you a, an authentic expression of what, of what it's like for people to work in pairs, so. I see a lot of collaboration up here between loved ones, partners. Um, I tried that once, and it was okay, and I'll never do it again. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is that a good idea, a bad idea? Like, I think one of the things that I found really hard was that we had this relationship as partners, and out of necessity to make a project work, we had to have this relationship as collaborators, and we had a hard time reconciling that. Is there advice for people who want to do collaborations with someone where they need to maintain these two separate relationships, one hierarchical and one where you're peers? I, I think that I think in Heather and mine's case, it, it helped that we were collaborators before we were in a relationship. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I also think that um, part of a good collaboration is, is the ability to, to say sort of mean things to the other person, mean things in the sense that you're criticizing work that they have done that you maybe disagree with or think could be better in some way. Um, and if you are romantically involved with that person, it can be really difficult to detach the emotional impact of that from the critical aspect of that. You know, there's the two sides. There's two sides of that. I think on one, on the one hand, the person delivering the criticism needs to try to do so in, in, in a constructive way so that it doesn't feel like a like a barb, like a personal thing. And the receiver needs to remind themselves that they're just hearing some feedback from someone who has an opinion and cares about the project that they're on. Um, and I think that that applies equally as much to conversation as a couple. That when couples fail, it's because they are also not doing that kind of uh, communicating, right? They don't, they aren't willing to be open to listen to this other op this other opinion that's coming in, uh, and they want to block it out or they want to uh, negate it in some way that happens a lot. So I think that they're, they're one in the same issue essentially. That if you, and if you can have really good if you have really good communication in your relationship, then you go, go collaborate with that person. It will work because you already. I think maybe it'll work. Yeah, like I guess I would say you couldn't you couldn't say that that one definitely would always would always lead to the other. I mean, I, well, I don't have any more current uh, examples because my my current um, boyfriend fiance we we, have, we don't really work on projects together, and partly because he had so many of his own already, and I didn't want to just be that girlfriend that went and worked on the on the project of her boyfriend. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, or maybe vice versa too. I want to. If we work on something, I want it to be something we started together that was separate from from either of our prior work. And but then also you have your own collaborations with with Amanda that, that are totally separate too. Right? Oh, I, I mean, I, I'll put that. I'll, I'll flip it a little bit and say. Um, uh, I mean, I I think that I completely instrumentalized Natalie as a collaborator. I mean, I, we had been dating for a couple years and she came in to help me on a come out and play project. And just the way that you were like putting that masking tape on those boxes for block call, I said, I'm like, God. Well, no, it just, you know, we had already been dating and we were living together. And I just said, I desperately need you as a collaborator when, when our history of games you know, said we want to do a project. So I, but I feel like our interaction Collaborating is exactly like our, the rest of our interaction. I mean, we we take her invite and 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 you know our whole our whole thing in a good way and in a negative way. And our collaboration resembles our regular relationship. But I'll also say for my collaborations outside of ours, you know, I there, there's a huge amount of love. Like I work with Colleen and John Sharp on Local Number Twelve. I adore those guys. Uh, Greg and Catherine and Josh. I work at Game Lab. Josh and I work in a project. I, I really love them and I respect them and, 
Uh, it, it was like a, it was a privilege to be able to collaborate with them. And so I, I would maybe flip around, and maybe this is my own neurosis, but for me, a collaboration is like a, a very a high form of love and respect. So it's not it, it's not that how do I collaborate with someone I love? I mean, it's how how could I think about collaborating with someone that I didn't love? How do we express love through our collaboration? Really, I mean, Phil and Cindy are like my family. Really, I mean, that's how Coco, that's how Coco and me is still together. Is because we're so close.
decided to work on something in a really interesting way together but separately. And it, um, it inspired me to try and create a session of experimental gameplay that focused on people who don't necessarily uh, road warrior it all the way by themselves. A lot of times, um, experimental gameplay workshop focuses on a one-man one show, um, literally a one-man show, um, where it's a physics game, typically, or something with a lot of very, very, very straightforward mechanics. And, um, and that's great. There's a lot of great games that are out there like that. But the session doesn't leave a lot of room for alternative approaches. And so that's what, that's what the session is about. Um, and it's an experiment. We'll see how well it goes. Um, so um, the focus is collaboration. Everyone here, including the panelists that are present from far, far away, um, collaborate uh, in order to create, um, and specifically have thought a lot about collaboration as a part of their process um, and what they and what they make. And so they're all going to be talking to you about that today. Um, so we have Michael Laurier right here. We have it's still not working. Then we can't tell. No, it's fine. We don't need to hear it. I need to hear it. Beauty sleeping is a peaceful and 
silent game and encourage us experiencing its atmosphere and exploring its environment. Your interaction with the little girl is crucial. She is not your avatar, but an autonomous character that you take care of. With this fictional child, you will find a way to awaken the princess through a joyful and delightful journey. One month on one project and another month on another project. So it's like off and on. To give ourselves a time, we had a theory that uh, that if we gave ourselves time off of the project, that the project would continue to develop um, in our minds, so to speak. And when we come back to it fresh the next month, uh, we could bring back a lot of sort of contemplation about the design and ideas and sort of feel a little fresher about the whole project just because we haven't been working on it for six months. Concentric is uh, an idea that we had for a game that was a combination of two other ideas. Uh, basically an idea of a real speech uh, was uh, a game about... We wanted how the universe was explained before um, we knew how the universe was set up so the Earth is in the center instead of the Sun. And you know, so in, in that sense, it's sort of a metaphorically speaking, man in the middle of the universe. Um, planets radiating out in um, discs or spheres. And the other idea was an idea of mine that I wanted to have a, a, a game uh, where you fly through a tunnel, like a, a traditional uh, tunnel shooting game, but where the tunnel itself was sort of more, it felt like a flower, because I felt like if you look into it, it looks like a tunnel. So I, I, I wanted to do something with that. I also like how sensual flowers were. We decided to keep the two ideas, Maria's idea and my idea, apart. This turned out to not be the best thing on earth, but I mean it was, it was a little funny because I think that the sort of maleness and femaleness of the design sort of came through and when we switched and suddenly I was confronted with something very masculine and he was confronted with something very feminine and then it became this sort of question of translation between the two of us. It turned out that her ideas that she had for this part were completely different than what I was expecting. I'm happy with the prototype in its prototypeness, but um, but I don't know what to, we should do with the game going forward. Eight, which was our first, very first game design on um, SCL. In 2002 began the project, um, or the first version of the project, where we read tons of different versions of the Sleeping Beauty fairy tales. It's like tales that involve sleeping princesses who are only awakened through uh, love strangers. Love um, so we were just learning about game design, however, um, so we were never able to finish that particular um, iteration of the game. So now that we've made a few video games and have released a few games, we decided to come back to this project. Um, we Originally, when we came back to our game eight or our first project. Um, our idea was to put the entire story inside of the virtual book. The book interface in the book of eight um, created a distance between the player and the story that was useful for navigation but was actually detrimental to the experience of the story. In this version of eight. Uh, we have sort of thought of this as more of like an archaeology. It's been 500 years since the princess has fallen asleep. And the, uh, the princes over the years have broken into the, the, the palace and have taken eight objects from the place where she sleeps. But here and there in the palace, there's uh, a window that is open. It's a small window, and, and so it's too small for you to come into. But a little girl can. Um, go inside. And when she does, you can, you can see inside the rooms of the palace. The little girl will get magical powers throughout the game that will help you correct all these things that are wrong. Like if there's a wall that is broken, she will have a spell that can, that can fix that wall. Or all the house plants are withered and the fountains are flowing, so she will have a spell to make that water work again. Or turn, turn the, the lamps on again.
radio signal?
to, uh, to getting good videos, interviewing really smart people uh, <laughs> about your project. It's great. All right. So, um, um, we, we, so we really wanted to talk to you guys about, Robin wanted us to show one, one project, so we showed a little bit of story happens. We want to talk a little bit about our process, how our process is collaborative, and then uh, try and keep it short so we have room for questions. So usually, when we've, we've done these four projects together, we start with a, with a context. Uh, uh, Baby Castle said sponsored Flatlands and hosted us for a uh, site here uh, next to Colleen. Um, what was one context, physical context, and, and audience context, and, and Momo was another one. We brainstorm ideas, and I often will make many, many ideas, and Natalie will pick this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, usually the reason is that, um, maybe just intuitively, there's no reason why those ideas could be potentially good game, but the reason why I'm Resistant is that they're very grid like systematic and so strict in appearance. So, as soon as I see something that looks more loose and more uh, potentially um, less square, um, that's it. Uh, and maybe this is coming from architecture, in some way, you know, to think that things must be symmetrical in our region state, that the experience would be so uh, asymmetrical. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, one thing we're going to gain now is Tommy, that we game designers, we cling to the grid like a, I don't know, like a, like a drowned drowning people with a, for a life, life preserver. Architects are dreaming about the fact that it's a little bit trendy, maybe, but anyway, about other form of uh, geometric analysis that could that mean. Uh, I mean, one thing about working with an architect is that, I mean, there, I always, when I talk about, hey, game design should be a field, a discipline, and a critical discourse, I always point to architecture. So for these people, it's like, oh yeah, grids, we were doing that about 500 years ago. You know, <laughs> we've gotten over that, right? Or, you know, that was, oh yeah, very mid 20th century. So it's, it's, it's great to work with, with, with someone in a field that has that kind of thing. I have to say that Philly coming from more therapy, in some way, I do appreciate very much how it's breaking the boundary. So we do a lot of prototyping. So these were three different, um, uh, three different uh, paper prototypes that became Starry Heavens. It started with numbers and um, and it sort of progressed from left to right. Um, we we do a huge amount of play testing too, live live play testing. It's sort of in, it, you sort of instrumentalize all of your friends and all of your social networks uh, when you're in a play testing frenzy, especially for this game that really needed ten or fifteen. Birthday of uh, two years old. Aren't <laughs> <laughs> anything? Uh, yes. <laughs> it's a balance sheet. My friend. <laughs> no. um, and usually, as we work, we develop the content alongside the prototypes. Here's an early version and the and the, and the last version of the rules. So we usually start with gameplay, um, and the content develops uh, as the gameplay develops. Um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the Talking Heads, you know, that David Byrne always used to say that they, in their early work, they would start a song by just kind of saying nonsense syllables like da 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 da, and then they would add the words in after the music. Music was kind of well established. We're a little bit that way with content. It goes back and forth from the game. We have an idea of the direction. This was about power and relationship with people. Would you betray? Would you keep your alliances? But really. We were really sure where it was going, and going back and forth. And I, I just want, um, what I'm interested in, so Eric is interested to the Greek with number like he's in the French. And then I kind of translate it in a Greek, which is still that way, but I feel like it's a good chessboard in a public park. I'm not happy at the time. And, and at the end, there's no real reason in the game why the platform on one bigger, one smaller, but just that look more like a, a, a constellation. And, uh, and it's just a tentative again to maybe in this way it's just hide the regularity, but to show it more as a um, natural or organic. Yes. And something in general about which is hugely different between what Eric does and what I do is that. We play chess so many times, but then I get one shot getting right <laughs> with all of the setup. And, um, and we can play chess up to a certain point where it's a feeling of the players. Um, but when we play chess, they had a $1 rule of 
object instead of a track feed um, wide weather balloon and seven more of that which does change a lot of the feeling of the experience. Uh, one reason was this was exhibited right in front of the glass facade of the Roma. Uh, if there was only a grid on the floor, nobody would perceive that this is something happening, we just look at the crowd and even you would feel old. I think it was just good to have a roof above your head to say here something is happening, we're like the same umbrella. Um, and I think that's something. Uh, well, that's something that I've learned working with Natalie. For those of you that know, 16 tons, it's a, it's a small grid with that paper wall around it. and. That wall is so important to the game. The wall is not mentioned in the rules. It's not an essential part of any mechanic. You can play the game on a tabletop without the wall. But, but what I've learned is that the way that that wall shapes base creates this kind of private betting pit is so important. Last year at IndyK, we were taking it down. People were playing that game for the very last minute. We took the wall down because we were having to pack it up. And the game was so imminent without that wall around it, just the, just the spots on the floor in a, in a, in a certain way. Yeah, they, 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 and so it's so what I one of the things I've learned from Natalie is that you know game designers tend to be very black and white. Well, this is part of the function of the game. This is not. But in 16 tons, the the the, the, the sort of halo of balloons, even though the central balloon is part of the mechanic, you're trying to pull it down step by step through the ruler and the different sizes of the grid. There there are these sort of gray areas where they, they do make the game a game, but they're not they're not intrinsically part of the part of the rules. Just some images. Uh, right. Uh, anything else you want to say? I, I, what I learned about games is that they are much more cruel and rewarding than architecture in a way. <laughs> because if it works, it's clear. And if it doesn't, it's even more clear. People won't play. <laughs> um, so it's, it's rewarding, it's immediate gratification, but it's also extremely uh, immediate when it's not. And, you know, games, architecture is for me, at Florida, is the opposite of immediate. I mean, it, it's amazing to work with a designer whose, whose objects, whose designed objects are meant to last for centuries or more, right? Architecture is so careful. They're so rigorous. If you make a broken game, no one's going to play. If you make a broken building, you're going to kill people. Yeah. So there's a, there's, I mean, there's, there, it's just, it's amazing from every, every aspect of architecture, the fact that, Getting an architectural license is similar to like getting a medical license because you have people's you know lives in your hands and it's just it's a it's a very it's a very different kind of uh, process. This is our last image. Um, we just this was just a little sketch that we found in a notebook on the airplane ride over here to ABK that we wanted to put in. And this is just our four projects we're thinking about how each one creates a different kind of physical space over here and a different kind of space of meaning or gameplay. And I think that in a lot of our ways, a, a lot of ways, and uh, we can't you know. We, we can explain what these little scribbles mean, but they're each each different the way that they constellate the, the gameplay space of meaning and the, and the, and the physical space of meaning. So it, it's really something uh, that we learn from each other. Fighting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, thank you very much. Person to say that, um, but when Damien and I met, it was actually on an online 
site for making music, and then subsequently to that, we actually became a couple, and that was uh, many years back, and then we started working on projects together, and this is the first of them. Um, I guess it was the first game project, because that was like the beginning of your programming career. Uh, Lapin, uh, Lapin Diver, and also on this project, Phil Fish was, was involved. And um, I think the important thing about this is we didn't really anticipate that the collaboration would, would go as well as it did because it was really intense, but it actually went so well that the three of us decided we really wanted to work on projects like that again, and that was like the basis of the founding of Kokoromi. Um, and Cindy came on very quickly thereafter because we worked on a project with her, and it was just like, it was like the magic happened. And I think part of that is just because of the differing um, strengths and skills that we all had and, and how they were able to sort of mesh together, um, both technical, artistic, um, managerial, or, or whatever. But also, of course, that, that we all got along together really well and, yeah, definitely have arguments and things like that. But, but we're able to get through them. I think that's the important thing. Does the, does the argument like completely shut down all possibility of, of moving forward or not? And, if it doesn't, then that's a pretty good collaboration. It's what you can hope for. Um, uh, I also wanted to, to just touch briefly on the projects that I was doing uh, specifically with Cindy because it also um, ties